Okay, thank you everyone, to those of you who stuck around, thank you for my Apple box. Um, so we have a really exciting conversation now on the future of food for Earth and space. In partnership with Food Tank, the purpose of this panel discussion is to grow awareness of the Deep Space Food Challenge, an open food innovation prize competition led by NASA and the Canadian Space Agency administered by the Methuselah Foundation to accelerate food production technologies for future deep space exploration and more near-term Earth applications. So this is just like next level. It's very, very exciting. Um, my name is Alexina Cather, for those of you who weren't in one of the earlier panels, and I am the Director of Policy Advocacy and Sustainability at the James Beard Foundation. We have a few remote guests um, that are gonna join us via video, and then four fantastic panelists in person. I'm going to let all the panelists introduce themselves, but we're going to start with some of our virtual panelists before we get to these four fine folks, starting with Monzi Roman. So Monzi, what is the origin story of the Deep Space Food Challenge, and why is it critical to innovate for the future of food for Earth and space? Hello, I'm Monzi Roman. I was the program manager of the Millennium Challenges when the Deep Space Food Challenge was started. We were excited when we were able to bring uh, together the concept of crowdsourcing, sustainability, and a technology gap that the agencies have related to the food uh, for our future restaurants together in one amazing package that is the Deep Space Food Challenge. NASA is a master um, of many people think differently. So we are requesting the help from the public in this competition to come and bring us those ideas of things that we might have not thought about. And, and the sustainability of this competition is so important because how much are we gonna use to start the process and try to reduce or eliminate the amount of waste. If we're using plants, for example, all the parts of the plants that are not used as food can be used for things like clothing or all kinds of other uh, products. The technologies that will come as a result of the Deep Space Food Challenge will have, um, of course, a lot of applications for space, uh, but also will have incredible earth applications. By providing alternatives for areas uh, that are currently food deserts, um, areas that are hit by, nat by natural disasters, or by areas um, that do not have enough water or resources to grow their food. So interesting. Thank you, Monzi. Um, next up, I have a question for Vicky Clarice. Vicky, from your more than three decades as a food scientist and manager of the ISS food system at NASA, how have you observed food impact astronaut, mor uh, food impact astronaut morale and psychology? My name is Vicki Clarus. I'm a food scientist and I worked for more than three decades with NASA food systems at the Johnson Space Center. When I first came to work at NASA, it was very early in the shuttle program. The missions were short and so uh, very few of the crew members were really super serious about what food they took with them. We had a, a list of items and they would come in and choose from our menu what they wanted for each meal. But as we transitioned into long duration space flight, uh, first with our crew members going to stay on Mir, and then with the International Space Station, it quickly became obvious that the psychological importance of food had increased a great deal. As NASA goes forward to a mission to Mars, it's going to be even more important because that mission is likely going to be close to a three-year mission from beginning to end. And so this, the Deep Space Food Challenge, it's a focus on the fact that food is going to be significantly important on that first mission to Mars. Right. I mean, if any of you are like me, who remembers very clearly eating astronaut ice cream, it's a really special treat, but I'm sure for our astronauts who are up in space for three years, it gets a little bit old. So really <laughs> interesting to think about, you know, astronaut nutrition and how food impacts their missions. So next up, we're going to hear from Chris Hadfield. Chris, how do you think efficient food systems that produce nutritious and delicious food will change the game for these long term uh, duration missions? 
Hi, I'm uh, Commander Chris Hadfield, astronaut, uh, three-time space flyer. And it was uh, Frederick the Great and uh, Ernest Hemingway who said, an army marches on its stomach. But astronauts boldly go also on their stomachs. And you don't want to be exploring the universe uh, eating, you know, reconstituted food and peanut butter. And on board the spaceship, uh, I sure wasn't going to boldly go on the reconstituted mashed potatoes that we had. But there was some excellent food, the, you know, thermostabilized Hawaiian chicken, and for me, a favorite, uh, the dehydrated shrimp cocktail. But when we go into deep space, it's going to be even more important. It's not just the nutritional value um, and what's necessary for your body, but it's the psych psychological value as well. Food is a big, important part of being human beings. And the further you get from home, the more important it is. So uh, I'm really pleased to be part of the Deep Space Food Challenge, both from uh, what I can contribute for some of my ideas, but also for my fellow explorers who are going to be out there eating that food in the near future. Thanks, Chris. And last but not least, we will hear from Simon Fleming. Simon, what role does nutrition play in overall astronaut health and performance? Of course, as well as all of us Earthlings down here. Hi, my name's Simon Fleming. I'm a UK-based doctor and the clinical advisor for the Deep Space Food Challenge. Look, human beings have been involved in manned spaceflight for the past five decades. Diverse nutrients are necessary to help astronauts and those in that extreme environment combat bone loss, muscle atrophy, cardiovascular dysfunction, upright intolerance, and all those other physiological changes we see in space. We also know that there's a variety of digestive illnesses and problems that we see because of a lack of fruit and vegetables from a fresh source. Nutrition plays a key role in combating the negative effects of space travel, like radiation exposure, immune deficiency, and those, those bone and muscle issues. So space nutrition must contain 16 essential nutrients with about 15% protein, 30% lipids, and 55% carbohydrates. We know that people in space lose weight at a terrifying rate most of the astronauts that have been studied can lost between two to five percent of their pre-space weight some up to ten percent microgravity means that you lose bone mass you get immune problems so nutrition plays a huge role in maintaining astronaut health and performance also it maintains your psychological well-being which is key for prolonged space flight Thank you so much to all of you who joined in virtually. Um, really interesting to be thinking about these issues with astronauts and their nutrition. Now we're gonna move down to Earth and um, I'm gonna e ask each of you to briefly introduce yourselves and then we'll kind of dig into our conversation. We'll start with you, Mackenzie. Hello, my name is Mackenzie McAleer. I'm with Fresh Produce Supply. We fulfill harvest demand from fresh produce buyers anywhere. We provision agricultural systems and beneficial biological production and are focused next year on the International Space Station, but in the next few years on uh, space craft, space platforms, the moon and Mars. Hi everybody, I'm Chef Joseph Yoon, Edible Insect Ambassador at Brooklyn Bugs. And also I had the great privilege to be the culinary director for the future of food at South by Southwest. Hope you guys have been having a wonderful time. And also now I just feel really humbled to join the Methuselah Foundation as our culinary advisor for the Deep Space Food Challenge. Thank you guys. Uh, I'm Dane Goble, I'm the co-founder of Methuselah. And I'm just very happy that uh, NASA reached out to us and asked for a little bit of help in running their uh, amazing challenge. Uh, so we did phase one last year and we're into phase two now. And I'm very happy to say that um, virtually all the winning teams from phase one are now coming into phase two and are gonna build awesome, amazing prototypes. Hi everyone, I'm Florina Goebel. I'm the communications director for the Methuselah Foundation supporting the Deep Space Food Challenge. And uh, Dane and I have the same last name because we are married, just full disclosure. Um, and so we also work together and are strong partners in this and very glad to be here. Oh, I love it. Um, okay, so let's start with you, Mackenzie. Um, what are your thoughts on maximizing nutritional value in our food through soil? 
You know, there's a common misconception that uh, a bunch of billionaires are, are escaping Earth to space, and, and simply not true. In order for humans to do anything in space, we have to take our biology with us. And when we think about what's happening in soil, the reality is we don't know. 90 plus percent of the microbiology in soil is a mystery to us, um, but that's where our nutrition comes from. And so as we think about going to space, we're using soil-based systems, we're using soil microbiology, studying minerals and nutrients, algae, bacteria, uh, what really makes life on Earth thrive. And we're taking that technology to space and studying how to make it resilient and build it into ecologies that support life. Really cool. Um, so Joseph, most of us here, even if we hadn't before, now know about bugs as a sustainable source of protein from some of the delicious treats that we've had over the last few days. Um, why do we need to normalize bugs as a source of protein? And also, why bugs in space? Like, like I'm glad you're here, but... Yeah, but why, Joseph? Why, <laughs> why are you here? <laughs> yeah, so let me try to unpack this a little bit. But, you know, at the rate that we are using the world's resources, the natural resources, we are at a tipping point where we will need to address how we will sustainably produce enough food for the burgeoning global population. And so in 2013, the UN's FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization, issued a report, Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security. And they don't claim that this is a silver bullet that will save the world, but rather it's like among the portfolio of solutions that we can, we can incorporate and the idea of eating insects means not to give everything else up, but rather if you were to eat insects just once a week, even that would have a great impact on the environment. So there's a tendency to think in terms of extremes, but what we're trying to say is that we are in addition to what you can have in your diet with over 2,000 types of edible insects with wildly different flavor profiles, textures, and functionality. And one of the things that I really appreciate and enjoy about sharing this message is that it's one of hope and optimism. It's one that we can dream the impossible and we can really be able to stretch the only limitations we have with edible insects is with our own imagination. And so when you think about bugs and space, like, yeah, why is this bug guy talking on the space panel? Didn't you compete and not even make it to the second round? <laughs> uh, yes, that is indeed true. Uh, with great, prize? No. <laughs> with great, great respect to my team, we put so much hard work into that. And a big tip of the hat to all the teams that did make it into the second round. And how humbling to be approached by the Methuselah Foundation to be the culinary advisor. And I think that a big part is that we've been so successful in transforming a global generational mindset towards edible insects. And so to what Mackenzie was speaking about, this isn't a tech race for a vanity project with deep space travel, but we wanna find solutions. How can we apply this technology to address food security and sustainability? And I think part of the success that we've had with edible insects can also maybe translate to deep space travel and help bring the humanity to the food, something that's been a really big part of our conversation here with all the people that have been involved with Food Tank and Zero Hunger, Zero Waste. All these ideas speak to the heart of the future of food. And to me, that's where the heart is, the humanity. And I think that's where the connection between bugs and space is for me. Thank you. And I think it's really important to remember, too, that sometimes here in America, we, we do innovative things and we're like, oh, we're so innovative and we're doing this new thing with food. But there are many, many cultures that rely on bugs for their, you know, big source of their protein already. Yeah. Th thanks for mentioning that, because over 80 percent of the world's nations and over two billion people regularly consume insects. And so it's not really this like it's weird maybe for us as Americans culturally and maybe for Europeans, but around the world, I mean, we're actually in the minority. Um, it's a good thing to think about for us. Right, okay. Um, so, Dane, I'm hoping you can give us a little bit of historical 
context on why space exploration helps drive food innovation here on Earth? If you can bring us back down to Earth, so to well, speak. I can, I can try a little bit. So I'll actually uh, start on, on Earth before we do the space thing. Okay. Um, so uh, when I think about exploration, one of the, uh, one of the most common things that the uh, or, you know, it's synonymous with scarcity, right? So uh, there's a lot of people who are, you know, f you know, dealing with food scarcity right now around the world, but just about uh, everyone who's an explorer has to consider their food supply, not just in terms of staying alive, but also, you know, staying sane and not eating your crewmates. So um, <laughs> if, if you go... <laughs> If, if you go back to, uh, just for fun, uh, if you go back to the 1800s, um, you'll see a really interesting parabolic spike in terms of life expectancy and also intelligence. Can, and can you just hold on, tell everybody here what a parabolic spike would be? Oh, it's like a, it's like a hockey stick. It's like, whoop. Okay, great. Thank like, you. you, if you I don't hear you, do, Alexander. He needs standard citations. Uh, <laughs> if you don't do the sound, it doesn't work right. Um, so yeah, so in the middle of the 1800s, you see that happen, and that's essentially because of food preservation, it, new different forms of food preservation. So this French guy named Nicolas Appert came up with food bottling, which then was kind of surreptitiously handed over to the English. Uh, if, nobody knows exactly how it happened, but then they then they uh, ended up with canning, and that's what enabled huge maritime boom, which then enabled a global ice trade, which then enabled people who didn't happen to live in a place that was really, really cold part of the year to actually keep their food for longer without having to cure it. And so because of food preservation at that time, that enabled exploration and enabled life expectancies and intelligence to increase in the 1800s at a staggering rate. And so for me, when I look at uh, space travel um, and the unbelievable impossible scarcity unbelievable high risk, but also really, really specific constraints. Everything has to be you know, hyper-engineered, because if anything goes wrong, you have a really bad situation. It's a perfect place to test out new technologies. So everybody knows about all the cool stuff that's happened because of space, but we're in an interesting situation right now because the, the current paradigm of uh, shelf-stable foods is, is no longer going to work on a uh, three to five year mission. right? Um, People talk about the, the potential of actually having to, if, if you were to do that, you'd have to send the food ahead of the head of the astronauts because the mass is so incredibly high. But by the time you do that, the nutri nutrients will have degraded to the point where they're not going to be viable for long enough to actually really do the mission right, or you're going to end up with such an incredibly small amount of uh, variety that you're going to end up in a bad situation. So, sorry, I'll go faster. Um, so what that necessitates is in-situ food production. You have to grow the vast majority of the food right where you're at. So that's another way of saying farm to table, except the farm is like your refrigerator and everything's in there. So I think it's really cool because if you can deliver on this premise, it can create a completely new uh, setup for decentralized food production back here on Earth because it's absolutely necessary up there. Yeah. Very, very, like, these are very complex things to think about, but I love the connection and the way that you guys are, are breaking this down for everyone. So, Florina, why is it critical to drive both international and global participation in the Deep Space Food Challenge? Well, one, um, uh, I don't know if every, everyone is familiar here, but when you're in space, your taste buds go through change. Your whole physiology goes through massive change, and food tastes very different in microgravity. Um, in fact, the common complaint among astronauts is that they don't really taste the food. They want it to be spicier. They want more flavor profiles. And the only way to achieve spicier, more diverse flavor profiles is to have spicier and more diverse people making that food. Um, and so, you know, that seems logical. But um, to put it into context, only 10% of NASA's food menu is viable for a mission to Mars. Just 10%. And so we need real solutions. NASA and all these space agencies need solutions. And what I love about deep space food is that it democratizes access. It democratizes the way that we come to those solutions. So anyone, anyone, no matter what their background is, uh, across the globe can make a team and compete in this challenge. And internationally, I'm very passionate about that because obviously, I'm, uh, international, <laughs> um, but, uh, what, but I'm passionate about this too is because the technologies that these teams develop 
should be used here on Earth to address food insecurity and world hunger now and where they are. What's going to work in Africa will not work in Asia. What will work in Southeast Asia will not work in the Ukraine. And so those people need to be designing food systems that work for them in their environments and with their own uh, knowing their cultural behaviors. Uh, I'm very into design thinking, and that to me just seems like a natural thing to do. So it's, it's very close to our heart to drive um, the international piece of this challenge. Um, and by the way, we are building that international prize. So NASA is awarding a million dollars to US teams. Canada is awarding a very similar prize pot. The international prize pot is at zero. And so we're working to build that. Um, and we can discuss more on that later, yeah. So how, how will some of this innovation like get back to the average person? So it's this big challenge. Is it going to NASA after that? Is, it, is some of the lessons learned going to be shared with you know, nonprofits or governments or other people who are trying to make these changes in terms of food insecurity and sustainability? Uh, that's an interesting question. So when NASA develops develop stuff, a lot of times it ends up in, in the public domain. They're very, very generous about that. The way that the current prize, the, the way that the prize is structured is that all competitors keep all of their IP. NASA just wants to be able to negotiate in good faith for a license to that technology. So I, I mean, this is probably reductive, but I would say a lot of it is a question of the economics of it. So they can take it to space, but if by some chance it's not quite a home run for that sort of thing, uh, you can, they can bring it to Earth, repackage it, uh, re, you know, reproductize it, and uh, you know, it's it's a it's tough to build stuff for space. It's incredibly hard to do it. So if you can do it up there, it's probably not going to be wild and crazy to do it back here. Space is the new New York City. If you can do it there, you can do it anywhere. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you have some thoughts. Yeah. To your to your question, um, the agricultural system that we're taking to the International Space Station next year is based on an invention that my father brought in. We call it GeoGrow. Uh, it's a soil-filled, centrally irrigated, revolving cylinder. So we grow plants in 3D with soil and gravity. And in space, that gives us the ability to grow more plants in less space with less labor. And, um, and to this point, uh, my father was actually reading an article in the Scientific American from the 70s that was talking about NASA trying to grow food in space and was talking about the advantages of gravitational effects or gravistimulation on plant growth. So our experiment to the space station is both to learn about the gravitational effects on plant growth, why plants take up more nutrients, grow bigger and faster, live longer, but simultaneously to study you know, what we can do with gardens and farms and grows and ranches on Earth in a lens of a completely self-contained, resilient system for space. And so whether you're talking about a tropical island or a container ship at sea, um, or a, a spacecraft, you've got to bring everything you're going to use with you, consider all of the variables, create a, a conducive environment, and, um, and when you start thinking about biological inputs, you, you can't run down to the farm store on the moon. Uh, so you really have to you know, consider how to bring an ecology with you. And, and these are just, frankly, things we've never considered as a species before. So it's a, it's a really exciting time. It's fascinating. Um, you know, so for those of you not aware of like what the requirements for this module is, imagine having a two cubic meter uh, space, like a refrigerator, powered by an average pull of 1,500 watts, which is like a space heater, that can help provide the sustenance for a crew of people, for astronauts going on a deep space mission. And then you apply that technology into like food deserts or areas that's like ravaged by war or in areas where we need that kind of food production. Yeah. Minimum input for maximum output. Those are the technologies that we want to do. We want to spark the imagination of children, students, scientists, educators, artists, and like really have this be an interdisciplinary collaborative project where we can really dream and imagine something new. I love it. Florina, did. Oh, last I, was, thoughts. I was just going to say yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and, f and for the first time, you have food scientists working with engineers, working with uh, college students who are into agriculture. For the first time, these people are coming together to work at solving a real problem with real requirements. Um, as a product manager, that's a dream. Uh, and especially if you have the opportunity for NASA, for instance, to be your very first customer, for this deep space food challenge to act as an accelerator, get some limelight on you so that you can get connected to funding and support to spin off your own startup, that is part of the intention of the Deep Space Food Challenge and part of why it's so powerful. I love it. 
yeah. just super quickly, it's also, it's a, obviously it's not an abstract thing, but also it's surprisingly productized because we care so much about acceptability, which is like a proper term for how palatable something is, but also the user experience. Astronauts are very busy people, so they don't really have a lot of time to fix stuff that breaks. It's, it's actually got to function and require very, very little maintenance and cleaning and that sort of thing, so. But more importantly, they all like good food. Uh, right, just like who the rest doesn't? of us. Um, well, thank you all so much. That was such an interesting conversation. I can't say that I've ever had one like that. So we're wrapping up the day. Really appreciate those of you who have been with us all day. Um, next, we have a treat. We're going to hear some spoken word poetry from Chris Carr, who will close out a fantastic day of programming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. We'll go that way.